Moreover, one of our own time, that very man who gained celebrity by his abuse of us, in the treatise which he entitled of abstinence from animal food, makes mention of the old customs of the ancients as follows in his own words, on the testimony of Theophrastus. It is probably an incalculable time since, as Theophrastus says, the most learned race of mankind, inhabiting that most sacred land which Nilus founded, were the first to begin to offer upon the hearth to the heavenly deities not the first fruits of myrrh nor of cassia and frankincense mingled with saffron, for these were adopted many generations later. When man becoming a wanderer in search of his necessary livelihood with many toils and tears offered drops of these tinctures as first fruits to the gods. Of these then they made no offerings formerly, but of herbage, which they lifted up in their hands as the bloom of the productive power of nature. For the earth gave forth trees before animals, and long before trees the herbage which is produced year by year, and of this they culled leaves and roots and the whole shoots of their growth, and burned them, greeting thus the visible deities of heaven with their offering, and dedicating to them the honors of perpetual fire. For these they also kept in their temples an undying fire, as being most especially like them. And from the fume of the produce of the earth they formed the words altars of incense, and to offer, and offerings, words which we misunderstand as signifying the erroneous practice of later times, when we apply the term to the so-called worship which consists of animal sacrifice. And so anxious were the men of old not to transgress their custom, that they cursed those who neglected the old fashion and introduced another. After these and other statements he adds, but when these beginnings of sacrifices were carried by men to a great pitch of disorder, the adoption of the most dreadful offerings, full of cruelty, was introduced, so that the curses formerly pronounced against us seem now to have received fulfillment, when men slaughtered victims and defiled the altars with blood. So far writes Porphyry, or rather Theophrastus, and we may find a seal and confirmation of the statement in what Plato in the Cratylus before his remarks concerning the Greeks, says word for word as follows. It appears to me that the first inhabitants of Hellas had only the same gods as many of the barbarians have now, namely the sun, moon, earth, stars, and heaven, as therefore they saw them always moving on in their course and running, from this their natural tendency to run they called them gods. But I think it must be evident to everyone on consideration that the first and most ancient of mankind did not apply themselves either to building temples or to setting up statues, since at that time no art of painting, or modeling, or carving, or statuary had yet been discovered, nor, indeed, were building or architecture as yet established. Nor was there any mention among the men of that age of those who have since been denominated gods and heroes, nor had they any Zeus nor Kronos, Poseidon, Apollo, Hera, Athena, Dionysus, nor any other deity, either male or female, such as there were afterwards in multitudes among both barbarians and Greeks, nor was there any daemon good or bad reverenced among men, but only the visible stars of heaven because of their running received, as they themselves say, the title of gods, and even these were not worshipped with animal sacrifices and the honors afterwards superstitiously invented. This statement is not ours, but the testimony comes from within, and from the Greeks themselves, and supplies its proof by the words which have been already quoted and by those which will hereafter be set forth in due order. This is what our holy scriptures also teach, in which it is contained, that in the beginning the worship of the visible luminaries had been assigned to all the nations, and that to the Hebrew race alone had been entrusted the full initiation into the knowledge of God the Maker and Artificer of the universe and of true piety towards him. So then among the oldest of mankind there was no mention of a theogony, either Greek or barbarian, nor any erection of lifeless statues, nor all the silly talk that there is now about the naming of the gods both male and female. In fact the titles and names which men have since invented were not as yet known among mankind, no, nor yet invocations of invisible demons and spirits, nor absurd mythologies about gods and heroes nor mysteries of secret initiations, nor anything at all of the excessive and frivolous superstition of later generations. These then were men's inventions, and representations of our mortal nature, or rather new devices of base and licentious dispositions, according to our divine oracle which says, the devising of idols was the beginning of fornication. 
In fact the polytheistic error of all the nations is only seen long ages afterwards, having taken its beginning from the Phoenicians and Egyptians, and passed over from them to the other nations, and even to the Greeks themselves. For this again is affirmed by the history of the earliest ages, which history itself it is now time for us to review, beginning from the Phoenician records. Now the historian of this subject is Sancuniathan, an author of great antiquity, and older, as they say, than the Trojan times, one whom they testify to have been approved for the accuracy and truth of his Phoenician history. Philo of Byblos, not Hebrew, translated his whole work from the Phoenician language into Greek and published it. The author in our own day of the compilation against us mentions these things in the fourth book of his treatise against the Christians, where he bears the following testimony to Sancuniathan, word for word. Of the affairs of the Jews the truest history, because the most in accordance with their places and names, is that of Sancuniathan of Berytus, who received the records from Hierombolus the priest of the god Io. He dedicated his history to Abibolus king of Berytus, and was approved by him and by the investigators of truth in his time. Now the times of these men fall even before the date of the Trojan War, and approach nearly to the times of Moses, as is shown by the successions of the kings of Phoenicia. And Sancuniathan, who made a complete collection of ancient history from the records in the various cities and from the registers in the temples, and wrote in the Phoenician language with a love of truth, lived in the reign of Semiramis, the queen of the Assyrians, who is recorded to have lived before the Trojan War or in those very times. And the works of Sancuniathan were translated into the Greek language by Philo of Byblos. So wrote the author before mentioned, bearing witness at once to the truthfulness and antiquity of the so-called theologian. But he, as he goes forward, treats as divine not the God who is over all, nor yet the gods in the heaven, but mortal men and women, not even refined in character, such as it would be right to approve for their virtue, or emulate for their love of wisdom, but involved in the dishonor of every kind of vileness and wickedness. He testifies also that these are the very same who are still regarded as gods by all both in the cities and in country districts. But let me give you the proof of this out of his writings. Philo then, having divided the whole work of Sancuniathan into nine books, in the introduction to the first book makes this preface concerning Sancuniathan, word for word. These things being so, Sancuniathan, who was a man of much learning and great curiosity, and desirous of knowing the earliest history of all nations from the creation of the world, searched out with great care the history of Taurus, knowing that of all men under the sun Taurus was the first who thought of the invention of letters, and began the writing of records, and he laid the foundation, as it were, of his history, by beginning with him, whom the Egyptians called Thoth, and the Alexandrians Thoth, translated by the Greeks into Hermes, after these statements he finds fault with the more recent authors as violently and untruly reducing the legends concerning the gods to allegories and physical explanations and theories. And so he goes on to say, But the most recent of the writers on religion rejected the real events from the beginning, and having invented allegories and myths, and formed a fictitious affinity to the cosmical phenomena, established mysteries, and overlaid them with a cloud of absurdity, so that one cannot easily discern what really occurred. But he having lighted upon the collections of secret writings of the Ammonites which were discovered in the shrines and of course were not known to all men, applied himself diligently to the study of them all, and when he had completed the investigation, he put aside the original myth and the allegories, and so completed his proposed work, until the priests who followed in later times wished to hide this way again, and to restore the mythical character from which time mysticism began to rise up, not having previously reached the Greeks. Next to this he says, These things I have discovered in my anxious desire to know the history of the Phoenicians, and after a thorough investigation of much matter, not that which is found among the Greeks, for that is contradictory, and compiled by some in a contentious spirit rather than with a view to truth. And after other statements, And the conviction that the facts were as he has described them came to me, on seeing the disagreement among the Greeks, concerning which I have carefully composed three books bearing the title Paradoxical History. And again after other statements he adds, But with a view to clearness hereafter, and the determination of particulars, 
it is necessary to state distinctly beforehand that the most ancient of the barbarians, and especially the Phoenicians and Egyptians, from whom the rest of mankind received their traditions, regarded as the greatest gods those who had discovered the necessaries of life, or in some way done good to the nations. Esteeming these as benefactors and authors of many blessings, they worshipped them also as gods after their death, and built shrines, and consecrated pillars and staves after their names. These the Phoenicians held in great reverence, and assigned to them their greatest festivals. Especially they applied the names of their kings to the elements of the cosmos, and to some of those who were regarded as gods. But they knew no other gods than those of nature, sun, and moon, and the rest of the wandering stars, and the elements and things connected with them, so that some of their gods were mortal and some immortal. Philo, having explained these points in his preface, next begins his interpretation of Sancuniathon by setting forth the theology of the Phoenicians. The first principle of the universe he supposes to have been air dark with cloud and wind, or rather a blast of cloudy air, and a turbid chaos dark as Erebus, and these were boundless and for long ages had no limit. But when the wind, says he, became enamored of its own parents, and a mixture took place, that connection was called desire. This was the beginning of the creation of all things, but the wind itself had no knowledge of its own creation. From its connection what was produced, which some say is mud, and others a putrescence of watery compound, and out of this came every germ of creation, and the generation of the universe. So there were certain animals which had no sensation, and out of them grew intelligent animals, and were called Zophosemin, that is, observers of heaven, and they were formed like the shape of an egg. Also Mo burst forth into light, and sun, and moon, and stars, and the great constellations. Such was their cosmogony, introducing downright atheism. But let us see next how he states the generation of animals to have arisen. He says then, And when the air burst into light, both the sea and the land became heated, and thence arose winds and clouds, and very great downpours and floods of the waters of heaven. So after they were separated, and removed from their proper place because of the sun's heat, and all met together again in the air dashing together one against another, thunderings and lightnings were produced, and at the rattle of the thunder the intelligent animals already described woke up, and were scared at the sound, and began to move both on land and sea, male and female. Such is their theory of the generation of animals. Next after this the same writer adds and says, These things were found written in the cosmogony of Tautus, and in his commentaries, both from conjectures, and from evidence which his intellect discerned, and discovered, and made clear to us. Next to this, after mentioning the names of the winds Notos and Boris and the rest, he continues. But these were the first who consecrated the productions of the earth, and regarded them as gods, and worshipped them as being the support of life both to themselves, and to those who were to come after them, and to all before them, and they offered to them drink offerings and libations. He adds also, These were their notions of worship, corresponding to their own weakness and timidity of soul. Then he says that from the wind Kalpias and his wife Bo, which he translates, Night, were born Aeon and Protagonus, mortal men, so called, and that Aeon discovered the food obtained from trees, that their offspring were called Genos and Genia, and inhabited Phoenicia, and that when droughts occurred, they stretched out their hands to heaven towards the sun. For him alone, he says, they regarded as God the Lord of heaven, calling him Bielsamin, which is in the Phoenician language, Lord of heaven, and in Greek, Zeus. And after this he charges the Greeks with error, saying, For it is not without cause that we have explained these things in many ways, but in view of the later misinterpretations of the names in the history, which the Greeks in ignorance took in a wrong sense, being deceived by the ambiguity of the translation. Afterwards he says, From Genos, son of Aeon and Protagonus, were begotten again mortal children, whose names are light, and fire, and flame. These, says he, discovered fire from rubbing pieces of wood together, and taught the use of it. And they begot sons of surpassing size and stature, whose names were applied to the mountains which they occupied, so that from them were named Mount Cassius, and Libanus, and Antilibanus, and Brathi. 
From these, he says, were begotten Memramus and Hypsiraneus. And they got their names, he says, from their mothers, as the women in those days had free intercourse with any whom they met. Then he says, Hypsiraneus inhabited Tyre, and contrived huts out of reeds and rushes and papyrus. And he quarreled with his brother Assis, who first invented a covering for the body from skins of wild beasts, which he was strong enough to capture. And when furious rains and winds occurred, the trees in Tyre were rubbed against each other and caught fire, and burned down the wood that was there. And Ussus took a tree, and having stripped off the branches, was the first who ventured to embark on the sea, and consecrated two pillars to fire and wind, and worshipped them, and poured libations of blood upon them from the wild beasts which he took in hunting. But when Hypsiraneus and Ussus were dead, those who were left, he says, consecrated staves to them, and year by year worshipped their pillars and kept festivals in their honor. But many years afterwards from the race of Lipsiraneus were born Agrius and Halliers, the inventors of hunting and fishing, from whom were named huntsmen and fishermen, and from them were born two brethren, discoverers of iron and the mode of working it, the one of whom, Chrysor, practiced oratory, and incantations, and divinations, and that he was Hephaestus, and invented the hook, and bait, and line, and raft, and was the first of all men to make a voyage, wherefore they reverenced him also, as a god after his death. And he was also called Zeus Milikios. And some say that his brothers invented walls of brick.